The troubles of life seem to weigh you down. Well, I found a friend that I highly recommend. He will stick closer than a brother, and he'll love you like no other. Yeah. You can't go back. What you see doesn't match what you believe. Hold on, wait and see. Holy name, oh magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt 
his name together. For the Lord is good. I'm going to say that one more time because we are entering service. For the Lord is good. And now that we're in this moment, it is time to give the Lord some praise. It is time to lift his holy name. It is time to exalt and glorify his name because the Lord has been great. He has been good. He has been loving and he has been kind to us. So let's all tune in into worship today. Let's be active and engaged and glorify by the Lord in this moment. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we come before you today to just say thank you. God, thank you for allowing us to see another day. Thank you for allowing us to gather on this online space yet again. God, thank you for allowing us to receive more of your grace and more of your favor. God, thank you that each and every day we continue to receive your love. God, thank you that every day you're with us. And God, today, as we gather here on this online space, I pray that God, you speak to us. God, have your way. Allow us to encounter you today. God, allow the presenter to Bring forth a word that will bless us. Allow the presenter to bring a word that will edify us. And through our edification, God, we pray that you will be glorified. Have your way today, God. We thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Morning, Duke Chapel. This is the time to put your hands together. We're going to praise our God. We're singing Hosanna. Hosanna. Great is the Lord our God. Won't you agree?
On behalf of Duke Divinity School's Office of Black Church Studies, greetings, as we welcome you to the 2021 Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture Series Worship Service. We are honored to have Bishop Gregory V. Palmer as our speaker this year. Bishop Palmer is a resident bishop of the Ohio West Episcopal area of the United Methodist Church and a Duke Divinity School alumnus who earned a Master of Divinity degree. As we continue to remember the tireless work, sacrifices, and roadmap that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. offered for the cause of justice, equality, and peace, we look forward to hearing and receiving the word God has for us today through Bishop Palmer. Again, thank you for joining us and enjoy the service. Bishop Gregory Vaughn Palmer serves as the Episcopal leader of the Ohio West area of the United Methodist Church. He was assigned there September 1, 2012. Born and raised in Philadelphia, Palmer is a child of the church. The son of Reverend Herbert E. and Mrs. Charlotte Sue Hewitt Palmer. Palmer's father is a retired United Methodist pastor and his mother, now deceased, was a school teacher in the Philadelphia public school system. Reverend Herbert Palmer and his wife Peggy reside in Philadelphia. Bishop Palmer received his undergrad degree from George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and the Master's of the Divinity degree from Duke University Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina. Baldwin Wallace College, Iowa Wesleyan College, Simpson College, Hood Theological Seminary, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, and United Theological Seminary has awarded him honorary degrees. He was a Dana deacon and elected a probationary member in the Eastern Pennsylvania Annual Conference in 1977, and in 1981, he was elected into full membership and ordained an elder in the East Ohio Annual Conference. His pastoral career includes student pastorates in North Carolina and post-seminary appointments in the East Ohio Conference in Cleveland, Canton, and Berea. Palmer also served as superintendent of the Youngston District of the East Ohio Conference. Elected to the Episcopacy by the North Central Jurisdictional Conference in 2000, Palmer served the Iowa area until assuming responsibility in the Illinois area in 2008. Palmer served as president of the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry from 2004 to 2008 and president of the Council of Bishops from April 2008 to May 2010. Palmer served on the commissions on, the, on a way forward. Currently, he is a member of the Standing Committee on Central Conference Matters and chair of the Comprehensive African Plan. He also is a board member of several organi organizations, including the United Methodist Publishing House, Methodist Theological School in Ohio, United Theological Seminary in Ohio Health, a family of nonprofit hospitals and health care facilities. Married for 44 years to his wife, Cynthia, they are the parents of two adult children. Monica is a public school principal in Charlotte, North, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Aaron is a senior product owner for an interactive technology company based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Cynthia Palmer is an, is an honors graduate in religion from Duke University. She is a senior sales director with Mary Kay's Cosmetics. She has received, she has served as a director of Christian education and as staff for several, commun, of several community action, action agencies focused on welfare to work projects. She is an outstanding student and teacher of the scriptures and has strong competencies in leadership development. A reading from Isaiah 40. O comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain 
and the rugged terrain, a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Call out. Then he answered, What shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all his lo loveliness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voices mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news news. Lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arms ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense is before him. morning, Duke family. We are honored to be worshiping with you this morning. So wherever you are, we invite you to worship with us. Let us exalt his name together. So this morning, wherever you are, we invite you to lift your hands as we celebrate the God of our salvation. There is something special about knowing our Savior. So worship with us this morning. Just to know Him 
Grace to you and peace from God and from God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Dean Jones, Dr. Goatley, and Dean Designate Colon Emmerich, to all of you who are the faculty, staff, and student body of the Duke University Divinity School, it is an honor to be with you for this occasion. Thank you for receiving me to participate in this service of worship and in the presentation that will come this evening. I am honored more than I can say, and what I owe to this institution can never be repaid, but I have now for 42 years tried to pay it forward. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Grant, O oh God, in this moment and in all the moments of our lives that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts might indeed find acceptance in thy sight. O thou who art our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Would you hear these words from the prophet Isaiah chapter 40? Comfort, O comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her, that she has served her term, that the penalty is paid, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cries out, and I said, what shall I cry? All people is grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. May God bless the reading, the hearing, the understanding of this God's holy and righteous word to us in Scripture. In 20 and 19, I was at a meeting, an ecclesial body, if you will, and in a painful, and I would add a cleansing moment in the long run, one of the persons in the meeting who was a part of that particular community cried out while we were in an executive session, and I quote now, we are in a wilderness, end of quote. His exclamation was not a positive affirmation of what we had been talking about and what we were experiencing and what we were observing in church and in the world. It was clearly a place that that individual, when he cried out, we are in a wilderness, that he did not want to be. And he did not want to see anyone else there. He did not want his church, the church, to be there either. He had seized upon this image of wilderness as a metaphor and a description of wilderness as any number of scholars like Walter Brueggemann have suggested as an unwelcome and inhospitable place. As I listened and watched not only this colleague and friend, but others in the room, 
but I also checked my own thoughts and feelings. It was clear that a nerve had been struck. There was silence. I could hear and observe some weeping and the wiping of tears. And the more I turned it over and over in my head and heart, what had been said, we are in a wilderness, the more a few things, a few questions, a few thoughts stirred within me. I first thought he might be right. Then I thought, and if we are, is that all bad? If he is right, if it's the right metaphor, the right image for the situation in which we find ourselves, how did we get here? If it is an apt description for our condition as church, as the nation, and as the world, where do we find hope? What does, if we are in a wilderness, redemption and a new future look like? Is the wilderness a context where God is active, or better yet, does God speak to God's people when they are in the wilderness? Like many preachers, like many of you who are listening, like those of you that preach and teach and serve, I immediately turned in my own thinking to the Bible and I ran up and down its corridors and ran up and down the streets of history and particularly the history of the church, looking for something to latch onto as I wrestled with the exclamation, the tearful moan that we are in a wilderness. It was not a naive acceptance on my part that I felt like I could do nothing about. It was more a statement of my own accepting a reality and also acknowledging that everyone and every group of people does time in the wilderness sooner or later. The question about wilderness experiences for the individual or for the community is not if, but when. But the larger question may be if we are in the wilderness or if we have been in the wilderness or if we're headed into a new wilderness, to what end and for what purpose? How did we get here? What do we do while we are there? Or perhaps most importantly, what is our vocation as preachers and teachers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, as the church writ large in all of our various iterations and configurations? What is our vocation while we're in the wilderness? How do the wildernesses of our lives come to us? Do we seek them? Are we driven into them? Are we led to them? Or better yet, led through them? Every person and every group needs a way and needs multiple ways to frame and narrate and understand the experiences and the seasons that we go through. Like the ancient Israelites, we often do this by looking back to see where we've come from and to take stock of the present moment in the light of history and in the dawning of whatever new hope may lie in front of us. In looking back, we begin to name not just the incidents, but the themes that seem to emerge in reflecting on our experiences in order to get a right and useful assessment of where we are now. And even when we can name what is happening to us now, we may only be able to do so because we are able to cross-reference it or to connect it to something that has happened before. In this season, in parts of our collective life, we may find the theme of wilderness is one that speaks to us. It describes our state and our condition. It describes how the church as an institution writ large, not just in the United States, but around the world may be feeling. It describes our condition and our state here in the United States of America and across a global landscape 
Consider, if you will, our national landscape that is filled with division, acrimony, and downright hatred. Consider the church writ large. I have not in mind any denomination. This would be true for all of us. That we feel like we're in a wilderness because we no longer hold the standing in society that we believe we once held. Consider this, if not an apt description of wilderness. Life is expendable because of our love affair with the implements of violence, particularly guns, in this nation. The lives of black and brown people are expendable because they are black and brown and not white. We are in a wilderness because of the inequitable distribution of the resources that nourish and sustain life and that make for thriving. We may indeed be in a wilderness because of our lack of care for the earth over time and on and on and on. You fill in the next rungs and ways of coming at whether or not wilderness is an apt description for where we find ourselves in this nation, this world, and in our respective churches. Suffice it to say, we live, as one author has put it in her book, in the age of overwhelm. There's a lot coming at us, and we have a lot to reckon with. The psalmist in Psalm 61 verse 2 may help us, where the writer says, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. The hymn writer picked up that theme from the psalmist. Well, sometimes the shadows are deep and rough seems the path to the goal and sorrows sometimes how they sweep like tempests down over the soul. But oh, then to the rock let me fly. To the rock that is higher than I. Oh, then to the rock let me fly. To the rock that is higher than I. But God chooses, my friends, I believe, it's my experience, my humble observation, to be present and to speak to us in all of the wilderness experiences of our lives, whether they are individual or collective. That, I believe, is what this reading from Isaiah, coupled with the occasion that brings us together, where we recollect together about the ministry and the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We are reminded that he spoke to this nation and on the global stage in his short earthly ministry in a season of wilderness defined by the boundaries of race and the overwhelm of war. And so there is this word that we need to tend to that reminds us from Isaiah's text that we are those who can experience and receive comfort because God comes to us in the wilderness. It is not that the wilderness itself is an innate good, but the reality is that we do end up, so to speak, in context and situations and places, however we got there, that are unwelcoming and inhospitable for the flourishing of human life. But God does not abandon us in the wilderness, even if God has been in any way an active participant in our wilderness experiences. And so this word comes, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, a word of tender compassion for a wounded and weary people. It is not a word where God joins us in our pity parties any more than God was joining in the pity party of those who had found themselves in Babylonian exile. It is, however, a sobering and truthful word that reminds the people that they are never abandoned by God. They are people who are seen they are people who are known. God has been tracking and tracing their steps and watching out over them as they go through the crucible of wilderness. God takes seriously there, in the case of the Israelites, in our condition. And God reminds us that there is not only comfort, but there is hope to be had. Maybe that's why my own forebearers sang, I'm so glad trouble 
don't last always. The word does come to us in the wilderness, first for comfort and for succor, with compassion that is tender. But the word moves beyond compassion alone. God speaks of things to come in this reading that you heard. The change that is about to happen. The painting of a new landscape. And first, there is the invitation that I see that while God is speaking and God is announcing God's action, God is inviting our complete participation and engagement. God is enlisting us in God's work of the new thing of the leveling of the mountains and the lifting up of the valleys. And that's why these few words that say, prepare ye the way of the Lord. This is not an invitation for us only to sit back and watch God work. We always ought to be watching how God is working and how God is moving to move us into new places, to move us from injustice to justice to move us from places of lostness to claiming our foundness, to move us from deep places of disease to places of healing and wholeness, to move us from despair into seasons of hope. But God, as God works, is always enlisting our participation and so one of the questions is, as we look at the landscape, you heard the litany of things that I use to describe, just a few things that I can see and you can see also about the wilderness of our age, of our nation, of our world, across any number of issues. How is God calling you and God calling me? How is God calling the divinity school? How is God calling church and churches to prepare God's way. Will we simply sit idly by, tending to our institutional wounds and longing for a way and a world and a church and a time that has already gone? Or will we trace God at work in the world and join God in that work now in bringing about, as Brother Wesley would say, new creation? Can we see what God sees? And can we hope what God hopes? And can we yearn for what God yearns for? Or in some sick way, are we really comfortable not being on the plain, but with the mountains and valleys, which are a signal of the disparities of our age between those who have and those who have not between those who are in and those who are not just at the margins, but way outside of the margins. What is our vocation? Can we hear like John the Baptist out of these words? Can we see in the same ways in which Jesus of Nazareth saw as he unrolled the scrolls a description of his vocation to set the captives free? Can we see and hear in our own time and place, not necessarily as solos at bully pulpits, but as people working together what Martin King saw and heard? that God was inviting him to, be, to give voice and to be a part of the work of energizing and mobilizing and sacrificing and suffering in order that the new thing might come. We as church, we as Christians, we as the followers of Jesus Christ must be the first in line to hear and see how God is enlisting us to fully engage in the healing of the world question for us is, do we see our work shaped by God's purposes of salvation and justice and shalom, or are we merely putting in our time while we're really gazing at our own ecclesial navels, which, by the way, don't look that good, and longing 
for a church and a world that no longer exists instead of being the church in the world that will help the world to be what God dreams that we will be. So friends, this is our challenge and this is our call. The prophet puts it in this way and the question is, will we get up on a high mountain and declare the good tidings of God's new future and God's salvation? Will we, in the face of acrimony, animus, meanness, and hatred, such as this nation saw on January the 6th in its capital, literally, not just symbolically, do we have a word of good tidings to share with this world? And will we lift up our voice with strength and declare those tidings? And say to those who are fearful that their day of reigning is over, that populations are shifting, that some people are simply not going to take any more what they seem to have taken in years gone by. And say to those that are of a fearful heart, this really is a good thing, a world that is more rich and a world that is more diverse and a world where all of our gifts are appreciated and received without regard to nationality or first language or how much melanin is in our skin or zip code or income or gender and sexual identity. Do we have the courage and the strength? Or are we merely getting by? <laughs> to get up on that mountain, not because we ever go alone, but to be reminded ourselves and to remind others that the word of our God will stand forever. And lest we cry that word, we have no word to offer a weary world and a bedraggled church that is stuck in the wilderness. But if we will partner with God, link arms with one another, God will do something with us, in us, and through us that redeems, that heals, that sheds light, not just heat. And we will watch the world made new. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Palmer, for an anointed and impactful word from the Lord. As we leave this moment, let us remember to contemplate and live out the message shared with us today as we traverse through the wilderness of life, knowing that God is with us, comforting us, showing us compassion, and calling us. God is calling us to be partners and to link together to continue the work of justice in the wilderness. Observing the message to us today, I offer this benediction. May the Lord, our God, continue to bless you, keep you, shine upon you, and anoint you for the work of which you have been called. In Jesus' name, I bless each of you as you go in God's abundant joy, surpassing peace and unconditional love. Nehemiah 8 and 6 and Ezra bless the Lord the great God, and all the people answered, Amen. Amen. Lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. When we receive a word from the Lord, our answer should be, Amen. Let the church say, Amen. Let the church say, Amen.